is a process that can take many images and create a sequence that steps through each of the images in a window such that you can easily see the differences between those images. I use this tool extensively and I do a first cut analysis on all the images collected during a capture session. And when I say all, I mean just not the light images, but also the calibration frames as well. It's a great tool for showing when one or more subs or cal frames do not look like the others when in fact they should be pretty darn close. After all, for a given filter, you're looking at images that have been taken of the same region in the sky with the same camera, filter, and exposure. The example I'm going to use in this video is taken from my NGC 6888 imaging project, which had 13 hours of integration using an HOO palette and RGB stars. What we're going to look at is the images collected with my O3 filter. To load images, you push on the icon of the folder at the bottom of the tool, then navigate your way over to where your images are located. So I'm looking for my NGC 6888 project. I know that on night one, I didn't collect any oxygen three, so we're gonna start with night two. Under lights, and we'll scroll down, and we see the HA images, and then we start to get into the oxygen three images. And what I'm gonna do is a shift select to get all of the oxygen three images for that evening, and I press open. Now, one by one, the images will be read into the tool. Then a window will be open, which will be the window that we'll be using to watch the blank sequence. Now, this is all the images from the second evening when I started collecting Oxygen 3 data. I want to go and get the images from the other evenings as well. So I'm going to press this button again. I'm going to go back and look for night three for this project. Go to the lights. So now I have my full set of Oxygen 3 images loaded into the tool. Keep in mind that these are all linear subs, so I'm going to need some form of screen transfer function to see what we have. The Blink tool provides two options for this that can be seen up here next to the small version of the image. On the first one, you basically select an image and when you press this button, it will create the STF based on that one image, and then it'll apply the same STF to all the images in the sequence. You can choose this one as well, and this one works a little bit differently. It will analyze every image and create a histogram transformation for every single one, and then lo load that in so that you'll see an adaptive view mapping the images to the to the screen. For what we're doing here, I'm going to I'm going to choose the first one here, this single STF for all the images. I'm going to use this particular version for two reasons. First, it's very simple to compute. It looks at one image, creates the STF, and then it uses the same STF for everything. Second is these images should be looking the same because they're all taken with the same exposure, camera, optics, and filter. And if there are any differences, I want to make sure to see them. And by using a single STF, that becomes very apparent. Since this one is adaptive to each image, it might hide some of those. So I'm going to leave that here. Now, the first thing I can do here is get a sense of what my data looks like. And by doing that, I can just press the play button here. And it's right now the default is 0 0.05 seconds per frame. It'll string these together and create an animation. Let's take a look. And as we play this, we're going to see a few things. First, we're going to see the images jitter around. And the jittering is due to the dithering that was done during capture. We're going to see some thin clouds coming in occasionally, which are really masking off the sky and reducing our contrast substantially. And we'll also see a few frames that have satellite tracks going across them. By running this sequence, I have a pretty good idea of what I'm dealing with. And there are some images in there that I don't think I want to allow to stay so that when I do the pre-processing, I don't want their contribution to go into the master image. So I'm going to want to call those. Before I do that, I want to show you another option, which you may not have run across before, which I find quite useful. While you can look at the entire frame, sometimes you really want to get an idea of what's happening for the target area that you're most interested in. And since this is, this is a window, I can create a preview if I want to. So I can click up here, I can come down here, and I can click create a preview that look, just deals with the target image itself. Now when I select that preview, 
the image will scale up and let me enlarge the window just a little bit so that I can get everything in. And now I can go and do the same blink sequence, but I'm looking at a smaller portion of the image. This really gives you a feel for what's happening to your target and it gives you some feel for some of the image structure aspects as well. So this is a handy little tip I just wanted to share. So the next thing I like to do is step through each frame one at a time. And I do that by scrolling to the top of the list. I select a frame. Now I can use these arrows to step through each image one at a time. And when I find an image that has a problem that I don't like, I can flag that. And the way I flag that is you'll notice that every one of these boxes is checked. If I find one I think is questionable, I'll uncheck it. Now this just gives me a visual reference to the ones I, I unchecked. We'll want to do something extra in order to do something with those images later. Before we go through the subs one by one and decide if there's anything we want to do with them, let me take a moment to look at a few of the controls at the bottom of the screen here, which we'll be using here uh, as part of this process. The first one we've already used, which is the file folder. This is the one you click when you're trying to add more images to the collection you have on the screen. The next one deals with a closing selected images. Selecting an image doesn't mean the checkbox is there or not. It means you've selected the line and given that line color and all the selected lines then would go away. Now when it says remove, all it's really doing is removing them from this list and removing them from memory. Those files are still in the folder they're in and this has no impact on that. The next command, which has an X at the bottom of two windows, says close all windows. And what it will do is it will empty the screen. All the images that were read in and open will be flushed from memory. The memory will be released. The files are still where they were, and it doesn't change the state of the files that are in the folder. The next button here, the disk icon, copies files that are selected to a new location. So if you had a bunch of images selected, you could make a copy of those uh, images, and they'll be copied to another file in another uh, location that you'll designate. Next one is similar to that, but this is one we're going to use quite a bit. This is moving the selected files. So you take the images that were selected in this list and it'll physically move those files to the new directory, which means it'll remove it from the directory that it was in. So the directory containing all of our subs will no longer contain it, but the new directory will have the removed images. These other controls we're not gonna use as part of today's discussion, so I'm not gonna get into them. But let's step through these and see what we're looking at. In this image, you can see a satellite track going across the field. Uh, these are five minute exposures, so you can run into those occasionally. When I first started astrophotography, I hunted down every frame with a trail like this and deleted it. Only later did I realize all I was really doing is removing some of my hard fought four and one integration time from the final image that was stacked. And image integration tool has excellent pixel rejection criteria so that the pixels from this trail will be rejected and the rest of the information from this sub will still be contributing to the final image. So we're going to leave that one right alone. Okay, now we're starting to see where thin clouds have come through and they're starting to reduce the contrast of the image. And those can hurt me, so I'm going to flag a couple of those to get rid of. Like that's pretty bad, so I'm going to take the check mark off of that one. That one's pretty bad. That's really bad. We'll take a couple of those out. You can see down here, we come back and have good contrast, but everything up in here was pretty uh, damaged by the clouds. So I'm gonna take those out. I'm gonna leave this one in. But once again, the next frame, we have another problem. We're gonna flag that as well. Now it's looking pretty good. Let's keep going. Okay, that one's a problem. There's a couple more. That one. Okay, so now what I need to do is find those ones where I've taken the check mark off, and I'm going to start to do some selections. And the first one, I'm going to do shift click to get the first two. Then from here on out, I'm going to do a command click to add the other images that I want to remove. Okay, I have them all selected. Now, the blink tool really doesn't delete the images in place. What it allows you to do is to move those images to a new directory on here. That's what this icon does here. So when I click on this, what it wants me to do is create a new folder where it's going to move those particular images. And the convention that I use is I take the last night's folder 
So in this case, we're looking for NGC888, night four. And I'm going to create a new folder, and I'm going to name that folder Rejects. I'm going to select that as the destination, select folder. And now those images have been removed from the original directories and moved into this common folder. Now, when you look at the list here, you can still see them. They've moved the files, but the image records that are in memory are still there. And if you want to remove the ones that are in memory, then you need to go over and you need to hit this button, which says Close Selected Images. In which case, all of those images are now gone. So I'll do this for every filter. And what kinds of things do I remove? I remove subs that are obscured by clouds. Uh, because I have to deal with some close tree lines, quite often I have subs I have to remove because uh, the scope is now pointing into the trees. I have to take those out. Occasionally, we'll have very high thin clouds, which cause star bloat. And if I have a lot of frames with star bloat, I may clear some of those out. The other things I look for are obvious tracking errors or elongated stars. My scopes are out in the driveway and they're somewhat exposed. So sometimes I'll have a problem with the wind. Other times there may be other issues causing tracking problems. Strong gradients that appear on some frames uh, from unwanted light, perhaps from the neighborhood. Someone turned on a spotlight when they shouldn't have. That's happened before, causing a few frames with very strong gradients, and I want to clear those out. Those are the kinds of things I tend to remove. What do I leave in? I leave in satellite trails and plane trails. As I said before, those things happen in very few frames. They're somewhat isolated to certain areas of the image. And the image integration process is very effective at doing pixel rejection, removing those trails while keeping the other data. And you really want all of the quality data that you can get to go into the integration that is making your masters. Now, if I'm done with this particular task, and what I want to do is um, clear the screen and move on to another filter, at that point, I want to hit this button right here. This will not only clear the screen, but it'll release the memory that's being held by the tool for those particular images. So I do this for all of the light frames, but I also do it for the reference frames that I've collected. Uh, most people don't bother doing that for their darks and their flats and so on, but I've found uh, that it's worth the few minutes it takes to do that because every once in a while you'll find that you have a light leak that was causing problems with some of your darks, for example, and you weren't aware of it. This is an opportunity to find that. And since you're going to be using this data to do an awful lot of detailed processing, it makes some sense to take a little time and look at everything you collected and see if there's any obvious problems that need to be addressed before you get too far into the process. So this is my first cut. Later on, after I've done the uh, initial pre-processing, I'll use subframe selector to look at other quantitative measures of the various subs, but that'll be a subject for another video.